So we went through a very important technique here of using numbers to make sure we're getting this to being stable. Yeah, the exact right product. A lot of people don't realize that once you've drawn the arrows, even a five-year-old should be able to draw the right product after that point. The hard part is coming up with the arrows. But once you put in the arrows, the arrows tell you exactly what the product looks like. They tell you exactly what bonds to form between the oxygen and the number six, and exactly what bonds to break between the six and the bromine. So if we just take our time and use numbers, we should always be able to draw the right product after we've got the arrows in. Getting the arrows is the hard part. What type of functional group does this molecule fall into? Um, the, uh, ether. This is that new type of functional group we're focusing on here in ether. What we've just learned then is a way to make or synthesize ethers. Generally speaking, when you're doing organic chemistry, as you may have already noticed, the pattern of the course is every couple of weeks you learn about a new type of functional group. And there's two main things you want to learn about that functional group. You need to learn how to make it, and then you have to learn what you can do with it. Well, right now we're learning how to make an ether. This is one good way to make an ether, just using a normal SN2 reaction. What starting materials do we need for this reaction? Well, we need a starting material like this. The technical name for this would be an alk oxide. Alk, because it has an alkane chain, and oxide, because it has a charged oxygen. Okay. Generally speaking, we use suffixes like I for things with negative charges, like chloride or bromide. Well, this is an oxide, because the oxygen has a negative charge. And what type of functional group do we have here? Well, we could just call this a halo alkane. We just needed something with a good leaving group to do this SN2 reaction. Well, neutral halogens can be good leaving groups. So this synthesis is an alk oxide plus a halo alkane to give an ether. This is called the Williamson ether synthesis. Williamson ether synthesis. I don't know how enthusiastic your instructor is about having you learn the name for every reaction. The most important thing is not the name, but just to realize this is just a normal SN2 reaction. In order to use the ether synthesis, this has to be primary or secondary. Why couldn't it be tertiary? which would block SN2. Yes. Yeah, we know the big obstacle to SN2 is stair kindreds. If this was tertiary, what type of reaction would we have gotten? Uh, an S1, S, SN1? Or Check your table. E2. Yeah, which one, which one of those? An E2. E2, that's right. Let's confirm that in the table. Where would we be in the table? On page 3 here. You wouldn't get an SN1 because the primary carbocation doesn't exist. Correct. Let's see. Now, if this had been tertiary, point to which row we'd be in. Yeah, tertiary, and so which cell would be in there? Yeah, E2. So we shouldn't be looking at these rows anymore. We should be looking at these rows because we have a tertiary. That just confirms your idea that there'd be too much steric hindrance for SN2. Okay. However, this is still not going to wait for an SN1 or an E1 because this is not just a good nucleophile, it's also a good mix. O- minus and N- minus are too strong and enthusiastic to wait for a carbocation to form in an SN1 or an E1. They're either going to rush right in and force an SN2 or an E2. You can see if you look at the last two columns, anytime we have these very reactive atoms, N minus or O minus, it's either SN2 or E2. They're not going to be patient enough to wait for a carbocation to form, which is what has to happen for SN1 or E1.
You got a pencil? Yeah. Always better to use pencil. Right. How many carbons are there in this molecule? In this molecule Oops, that I'm pointing to on the board. Are, there are um, three. That's right. I think for a second you had this numbered as if it was another carbon. That's a very common mistake. There's only carbons, well, there's no carbon here because this is an oxygen. That's a common mistake that we have to watch out for. That's right. Now, this is just our choice. It's neither wrong nor right to number things. We're just using these as tools, but that's not a tool that we need. Why do we need to number the carbons? Because there's more than one carbon, and it's hard to keep track of them. If there was more than one oxygen, it would be helpful to number that, too. But like you said, since there's only one oxygen, there's no need to number that. That looks fine. What type of mechanism was this? An S and 2. Right. Now, which row are we in in our table? We are uh, in, um, we have a, a, we have um, a secondary carbon. Now, start by labeling the alpha carbon. I mean, I'm sorry, we have a methyl. Right. Methyl group, excuse me. Notice that this is the electrophilic carbon over here, not over here, and this is a methyl, so that's the very first row. It's not even primary, but methyl. Yes. And then which column would be in? Right. Now, this is starting to get a little bit bulky over here, even though it's not as bulky as terpene oxide, but it really doesn't matter. In this first row, all we can ever do is SN2. So we know for sure this is going to be SN2. You can't possibly do an elimination if there's only one carbon, because elimination means forming a double bond between two separate carbons. Well, we don't have two separate carbons to form a double bond. So that's why the methyls always have SN2. You drew the right arrows for that. Then we can use the numbers to get our product right. The number one's connected to the two, the two's connected to the three, and to the oxygen. The oxygen is connected to the number four. If you want to, you can write this as CH3, or you can just use bottom line notation, whichever you like. You should have the spectator ion moving over to keep the iodide company. That was good. You also saw that this was really ionic, even though I didn't put in the charges. It's important to draw the charges ourselves. By the way, is this an ionic bond? This is not an ionic bond because this is between a nonmetal and another nonmetal. We don't want to assume, assume that all the bonds are ionic, only between a metal and a nonmetal, especially sodium and potassium. Who was the nucleophilic atom here then? The one on the left or the right? Uh, the oxygen, the negative oxygen. Yeah, I meant to say who was the nucleophilic molecule? Well, it was this oh. molecule on the left. This disturbs some students because usually when we first learn about SN2, when we first learn about SN2, the nucleophile is usually smaller than the electrophile. So students get a little uncomfortable when the nucleophile is bigger than the electrophile, but it really didn't make a big difference, did it? We just obeyed the arrows again to get the right product. It didn't, I think that was why for a second you thought that this was the alpha carbon, because it was in the bigger molecule, but this is still the nucleophile. This is the alpha carbon over here. Sometimes the nucleophile can be bigger than the electrophile. That doesn't cause any problems. Okay. What type of functional group is this? Uh, ether. Ether. Well, this is another one of those Williamson ether syntheses, where we took an alk oxide and a halo alkane to make an ether.
So we're not going to get we're not going to get um, ethers from uh, uh, elimination reactions. Then. That's true because an elimination reaction mm -hmm. it makes it a pi bond. Yeah. Well, pi bonds don't have anything in particular to do with ethers. Okay. The way to make ethers is with these SN2 reactions. At least that's one good way.